question. Uh, this talk will be presented by Sriram Natarajan, who is a professor at the University of Texas at Dallas. Uh, Zuriram is uh, one of the leading figures in the statistical revelation of artificial intelligence field. He is uh, especially interested in uh, human in the loop uh, statistical revelation of artificial intelligence and application to healthcare. So, please welcome Zuriram Nataraji. Um, thank you. Uh, it's, it's truly an honor to be here. It's it's really nice uh, place and um, it's been amazing. Um, so, uh, as Fabrizio said, I'm Sriram. I'm at the UT Dallas uh, uh, right now. Um, the slides, most the beginning part, are definitely based on the tutorials that we give normally on statistical relational AI. Look at that, Christian Kusting, David Pool, and myself. Um, I also have taken some slides from Pedro uh, and my graduate students, Tushar, Philip, and Shul, uh, for preparing this tutorial. Um, Though the title says Human Allied uh, Star AI, in the first half, maybe even 60% of the talk, I'll be focusing on structure learning inside Star AI. How do you learn the structure of the model um, for these probabilistic logic models? And then in the second uh, part, I will focus on how can we bring human knowledge into this, okay? And uh, please feel free to stop me anytime, ask any questions, make it as interactive as possible. Otherwise, it feels like I'm talking to robots. You're building robots, not talking to robots, right? So um, this is our group, a little bit uh, background on who we are. Uh, we have a research uh, professor, uh, Dr. Gautam Kunopoli, and we have about a dozen PhD students uh, in our lab. Um, three PhD students have uh, graduated, of course, uh, several uh, key collaborators that we work with, and uh, thanks to uh, all the funding agencies that have been supporting our work. So this is who we are. What we do is we call ourselves the Starling Group. Uh, Starling stands for Statistical Relational Learning and actually optimization. We couldn't add an O on it. Uh, so on the outer periphery are the problems that inspire us. And uh, on the inner side are the, the methodologies that we develop uh, inspired by the problem. So um, as Fabrizio mentioned, one of the uh, key uh, uh, research areas in our group is physician health and healthcare in general. So we look at uh, electronic health records, we look at uh, clinical survey data, we look at imaging data, um, uh, we look at social interactions um, for predicting both disease states, um, side effects of treatments, um, um, drug drug interactions, and so on. Um, we also have started working with a logistics company in building uh, tools for uh, transportation. Um, and, and we work on, we dabble with NLP. We don't really do the deep NLP, um, but we do a more on relation extraction. Uh, we, we work on statistical relation learning, so logic uh, relations, graphical models, putting them together. As I said, human in the loop learning has been our recent focus. Um, because uh, Dr. Gautam Kunapuli is an optimization expert, we have also started working on some optimization methods in our lab, um, along with, of course, core machine learning and reinforcement learning. So this is what uh, we are doing. So what I'm thinking of as human allied star AI are uh, the development of systems that can seamlessly interact with, learn from, provide feedback to, and collaborate with a human agent. So um, this is slightly different to the adversarial machine learning that we think about all the time. This is more on human, a good human trying to work with, um, uh, work with the system. So what I'm going to do in the next two to three slides is kind of motivate the idea of human allied AI from several uh, real uh, examples and then we will go and, and uh, for specific uh, instances. So one uh, instance of human allied AI, human allied AI or human allied star AI is what we call as assistantship learning. In the assistantship learning, the agent uh, or the computer is trying to serve as an assistant to the human. Okay, so think of a clinical decision support system that sits inside an electronic health record. Okay, I'll, I'll tell you a real story. We'll start with a story. I mean, I'll tell you a real instance uh, that that happened. So last year I was at the doctor. Okay, and uh, for, for something, I think my headache or sinus, some infection, and uh, he was asking me questions. And it is a he. He was asking me questions, and I'm answering them. Of course. We are professors, so we are always busy. So I'm looking like this and answering him, right? So my phone was on my side, 
I'm looking at my phone, answering all the questions. At, at the end of about five minutes of questions, he asks me, so Sriram, are we done? I mean, have you told me everything that I need to? I said, yes. And that's when my wife, who was sitting next to me, gave me a tight slap in the black. But I, I was startled, not because it was paining. She's too tiny, doesn't hurt. But just the fact that somebody touched me, so I turned around and, and, and she goes, you have diabetes. And you didn't tell the doctor, okay? I'm telling you guys. So it's not a taboo, right? It's just that I'm looking at my phone and completely forgot it's out of my memory. And that is the most important information the doctor has to know because most uh, of the medicines can elevate your blood sugar. And so the doctor has to figure out that in the treatment plan. This is not a regular doctor. This is a healthcare clinic that I'm going, an urgent care clinic that I went to. But imagine a system which can have access to this full information. Then when the do doctor is prescribing something, the, the system could raise an alert saying, he may not have told you, but he has diabetes. This drug is known to increase the blood sugar. Do you want to give it to him? So to do this, in, in my head at least, there are two components involved. First is the, is the tracking of disease state. It's, it's getting some kind of a distribution over something, right? So that's why I think the first step of such a clinical decision support system is going to be a graphical model. It could be, and in my head, it has to be a probabilistic logic model because um, there's a lot of relations, a lot of uncertainty, and we need to model all of them together. So you run your probabilistic logic model, you get the output over whatever you want, right? In, the, in my case, it is an output over disease state. It is output over the probability of having a, a particular disease or, or a distribution over the diseases. And then using that, you do your classic planning, reinforcement learning, partially observable MDP, well, however you want to do this. Um, that's your action selection, okay? So there is, there is this problem of probabilistic inference where I'm getting a distribution over a particular set of uh, target concepts that I'm interested in. Using that distribution, I'm going to do probabilistic planning of some sort. And with this planning, I could come up with several uh, outcomes because the outcome of any planner reinforcement learning is actually an action, right? You want to take a set of actions or one action, an abstract action, decomposition, and so on. So they could be recommending treatment plans, pulling up additional information, maybe coming up with uh, alternative hypothesis. A cool thing would be, in my head, at least something like, oh, you want to prescribe this drug. This person has this uh, condition. And it, there is a recent paper that came out last month about this drug actually increasing this condition. So in my head, you can, you can have a system that is even up to date on, on medical literature, right? And so then it just su suggests the, um, the clinician. So here is the key thing. We are not interested in uh, replacing the doctor. We are interested in supplementing the doctor, in, in argumenting the doctor with more information, with relevant information, so that they can then make their own diagnosis. And then they can say, no, 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 but his, his uh, cholesterol level is too high. His blood pressure is too high. I don't care if, it's, uh, if his sugar level goes a little bit above. We need to bring the BP down. So I'm going to give him this. So they can, they can kind of, you know, imagine a chatbot, but an intelligent chatbot, that they can have this conversation and keep going. And to me, to do this are two important components, a probabilistic graphical model, um, a probabilistic relational graphical model, logical graphical model, uh, coupled with a, a reinforcement learning or a planning agent. Okay, so this is what we call as assistantship learning. There's been some work on this and we've uh, we done a bunch of work on, on this direction and continuing to do this. The second one is where some task or subtask of the human can be offloaded to an agent. Okay, so the machine can do some part of what the human wants to do. And there the machine just serves as an apprentice to the human. So. Um, the doctor could say something like, you know, I want to prescribe um, uh, prescribe this. Or the most classical example that I have now is I'm working with a pediatric surgeon. And uh, turns out that surgery notes are pretty standard. The way they write notes after every surgery is very standard. The key thing to note is there are some parameters that they change, but then the notes are standard. But the thing is that the doctors, two doctors don't write the exact same notes. Actually, what we did was we took... Uh, Mike Skinner, uh, Mike Skinner's uh, notes, and he looked at about 100 and odd of them. No two of them were the same. 
okay but they can be standardized they can be written so think of a system where mike skinner is sitting here saying hi um these are the conditions i observed prepare my surgery note and it should be done automatically right so where some part of the human effort can be offloaded and that become what is called as apprenticeship learning um the last one that we are working on is also co uh, collaborative problem solving this is a darpa program that we are working on that uh, we have made some strides on the, uh, strides on this in the last uh, couple of years here there's a machine there's a human but the human is not an expert anymore the human is also learning along with the machine the best example that i have is due to uh, paul cohen uh, former darpa director and now i think he's a dean in upet um, and he has this nice example where he says um, think of the machine and the human as two children and uh, um, they are basically telling each other who i have a horsey you have a horsey let's go to the park and figure out how to play right so both are exploring in this world they are trying to collaboratively solve a problem and um, and and into that effect both are exploring sharing their knowledge communicating with each other and then trying to solve the problem okay so these are what i think of at least instances of human allied ai that we are working on there could be multiple more instances but these are the ones that uh, we are working on so what have we done concretely towards this so uh, to do this i think uh, there are at least six things that i highlighted again that could be uh, a dozen more things that i missed but six things that i think that are important first you need truly hybrid models because many of these data are multimodal right you have different types of data sets so in an electronic health record you have of course electronic health record and then you have lab tests you have images um uh, and and cognitive tests sometimes sensor data you have a whole bunch of uh, data sets that you get and how do you integrate them how do you learn with this multimodal uh, data sets rather than forcing the data to uh, to satisfy the assumptions of your model and we do the opposite let the models faithfully uh, capture the data um of course the, the second component is what uh, uh christian kirsting talked about i guess on the first day on large scale reasoning because you're you're uh, quickly um the number of objects the number of observations explore and you want to make sure that you have some efficient reasoning methods the thing that is kind of ignored and i hope that i can come to come to it a little bit later um is what is called temp faithful temporal modeling right so if you ask anybody who how do we do temporal models the immediate answer is let's do hidden markov model let's do dynamic bayesian network the problem with hidden markov model and dynamic bayesian network are that we get uh, we assume that the observations come at fixed time intervals that is we discretize time we talk in terms of days we talk in terms of hours minutes and so on but if you think about it the world changes in hundreds of thousands of years and men move around uh, or the humans move around in about thousands of years but people born and die in about hundreds of years right that, that's the most and then we change in matter of years and of course uh, flies they live matter of days so things happen at different levels of granularity of time and observations come at different granularity a more concrete example is as i said i have diabetes i go to the doctor four times uh, 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 a year some of you look very very healthy you probably go once in four years we don't get the same number of observations what is the point of putting all of us on the same template right with dynamic bayesian networks we are all forced to put on the same template so there are models called as continuous time models that allow time to be a continuum and you basically say i'm getting uh, an observation and i'm going to work off of it so uh, i will refer to them uh, um, later but i think that those are the type of models that are important uh, now because you need to faithfully model time um as i said we need good planning and reinforcement learning algorithms i'm not going to talk too much about this but what i'm going to talk about is really the probabilistic logic side where we can learn in a scalable manner with complex relational data in the presence of noise and uncertainty and i'm pretty sure uh, of course i can see christian is in the back uh, seat but i'm pretty sure he would have given this uh, uh slide and talked about the fact that we need a cross over of uh Uh, learning um, of several fields of computer science and at least we think a smaller subset is absolutely necessary uh, to solve the problem which is uh, the use of databases or logic for representation uh, some kind of a learning uh, or mining methods that learn on top of these while modeling uncertainty and can scale to pretty large uh, data so and uh, 
if you have seen this a uh, couple of slides uh, i'm sorry but uh, just to refresh your mind again we have made progress uh, we have learned uh, we have uh, developed a lot of learning algorithms, decision trees, optimization, support vector machines, neural networks yesterday, deep neural networks tomorrow, deeper, deeper neural networks day after, deepest neural network on Saturday, right? So we're going that fast in our learning methods. Uh, we have a lot of progress in logic. There's a community that's been going on for you know, uh, a century now at the very least. They're doing a lot of interesting work. Of course, we can do uncertainty modeling um, using many of these graphical models, and then we started putting them together. Um, if you put all three together, you get statistical relational learning, probabilistic logic learning, uh, and so on. So where um, you're, you're learning um, uh, higher order models in a stochastic world so that you can model noise and uncertainty, right? So uh, that's what statistical relational learning is. If you, if you go to the representation and you uh, assume standard vectorized uh, representation, a flat feature vector, you get your classical machine learning. Um, uh, if you don't assume uh, noise and uncertainty, you get inductive logic programming. That's why some of the work here is also called as probabilistic inductive logic programming. And of course, you have probabilistic logic, first order logic, and so on. So there's this cube um, that you can say. For all the graduate students, right, when a speaker is putting a cube like this, you should always be uh, sure that their work will be the star on the top right, OK? Whenever you see a cube, don't look anywhere, because the speaker is speaking. Their work has to be in the top right corner, right? Because everybody likes to put their star on the top. Um, and, but in, in, some cubes are more justified than the others. And uh, I want to think that this is one of them. Let me concretely give you an example uh, before uh, we jump in. Let's say you're interested in predicting the heart attack of a person. Uh, a simple way to do that could be uh, to learn, uh, let's say, a decision tree of some sort. Um, this is what uh, was called as relational probability trees. Um, and then there were also tilde trees. Uh, a few, uh, uh, probably even like six, seven years before that by Hendrik and others. So let's say you're interested in predicting the heart attack of a person. You are looking at whether the person is a male. And then uh, uh, based on that, you, you do your split. Of course, um, it's well known in the, uh, in the medical community that men are more prone to heart attacks than women. So it's pretty reasonable that your model can learn this. Um, so the good news is that, that women are less prone to heart attack. But the bad news is that heart attack is much more lethal in women than they are in men. So I have known somebody who is a male who has had seven heart attacks and is still living, right? But women cannot handle that many heart attacks. So, um, so there's some weird balance going on there. Um, and then let's say you go down this path, which says, yes, this is a male. Then you look for, this is where logic starts kicking in. Okay, this is an existential, it basically says, um, if cholesterol of the person, uh, when the person is greater than 40, has ever been greater than 200, okay? If any of you are more than 40 years old and you know your cholesterol level, do not get a heart attack by looking at this. It's a made up example, okay? Um, so none of this is true. So what you're trying to see is basically, if I have tried this logically, I'm saying there exists an age and a, a level such that uh, if the age is greater than 40 and the level is greater than 200, then there is a 0.8. Uh, uh, probability of a heart attack, which means 0.2% probability of a not heart attack. So these are probability of heart attack being true. So they don't sum to one. Okay? These are all the probability of heart attack being true. So the false is basically right next to it, 0.8 comma 0.2. Okay. So um, let's let's think about this for a second. What does this say? If I'm putting this person on a uh, timeline, okay, I'm just drawing a one-dimensional figure, and I'm saying this person is on this particular timeline and uh, I'm going to chop off the timeline at uh, the age of 40, throw the data before 40, look at the data after 40, and check if at any point in the data after 40 has the level been greater than 200. Okay? So that's a pretty powerful representation and one of the simplest representations in logic that you can get for free uh, when you use these logical methods. Um, you go down this direction, of course, because it's what we call a conjunction, there are three conditions. and um, this could fail because of either of them. So this could fail because the cholesterol level has never been greater than 200 or this person is less than 40, okay? It could be because of any of these two reasons. You go down here, now you look at the father of the person having diabetes, and then you go down. Um, so now you start having relations. Now you talk about the father of a person having diabetes or um, the father of the person having heart attack or, the, or any of the ancestor 
having diabetes, right? It doesn't have to be just the father. It can be your grandfather, your grandmother, and so on. And then you come down and you check for the BMI of a person. The thing I want to really emphasize here is from, a, from the, the power of logic is that you can talk at the level of objects. So I'm related objects. I can talk about my father, my father having diabetes. I can talk about my attributes, particular values, or a particular specific value. At the age of 55, is the BMI greater than 30? So now I can have specific groundings and talk about the groundings. When people talk of these classic machine learning models, they miss the fact that you get so much from the power of logic for free if you have a good learning system, okay? So what I'm gonna talk about in the next, uh, I guess, 20 minutes, and stay with me, don't close your eyes yet. I've seen several of you trying to close your eyes. Uh, you have enough chances to sleep. So stay with me for the next 20 minutes. We'll have a small break to refresh, and then you can go back to sleep. Um, so what we're going to talk about is really focus on a little bit of structural learning. How do you learn these models? Um, and how do you actually effectively learn these models? The, we have developed a bunch of boosting approaches that pretty much work on a lot amount of data. And then uh, after uh, you, you fuel yourself with coffee, we'll start talking about how to get humans involved in these models. Okay. Any questions so far? As I said, feel free to interrupt me anytime. If it was cla my classroom and you're closing your eyes, I'll wake you up and ask a question. But because uh, you paid for this, we don't want to do that. So uh, we'll talk about uh, learning, right? So uh, again, um, the learning setting is pretty uh, standard here. Um, the parameter learning asks the question, where do the quantifications uh, come from? Okay, so where do the quantifying relationships come from? So I have a model structure. Where do the parameters of these model come from? And structure learning is where you kind of do the full model learning. You don't really have both the qualitative and the quantitative structure. So you don't have things um, that talk about what influences what, and then talk about how they influence. So neither the structure nor the parameters are learned. So how do you learn uh, from that? So the evidence are essentially partial assignments of values to variables. So in the classic uh, uh, alarm network, this boils down to burglary being false, Let's say earthquake being true. I don't know the value of alarm. I don't know the value of John calls, but I know that Mary called. Okay, the classic alarm network. And we'll talk about that a little bit. So, in the next 20 minutes or so, what I'm going to do is kind of introduce, um, uh, go through, in some sense, what has been done in the community. Okay, so very briefly on parameter learning, inside graphical models, statistical relational AI models, um, and do the same thing with structure learning. Um, and if uh, any of you are here and I have missed your paper, sorry, uh, I'm, I'm really sorry about that, but, but this happens because we want to keep it as focused as possible. So how to learn the parameters? Uh, the, the standard thing is maximum likelihood estimation. So let me ask you a question. Okay, there are two things that I'm going to talk about. One is I want to figure out, uh, uh, let's say, if, if I want to uh, take a train or a plane. Okay, and I'm asking you the question, uh, which one should I take? A train takes, uh, let's say, one hour. Uh, a plane takes 40 minutes because you have to get to the airport. Blah blah blah. Okay, what's the first question you'll ask? Should I take a train or a plane? That's my decision. What What would be your question to me? Anybody? Sorry. In the same place. Okay, I want to go from here. I don't know to uh, to Venice. Okay, or or. There's no airport in Ferrara, but say Bologna to Venice, and you have a high-speed train that takes you in one hour, um, and uh, you have a plane which takes you 40 minutes because they have to pull out, fly, land, go to this thing. Okay, which one will you take? Set the personal preferences aside. I always prefer a train to a plane. Let's not talk about that. Purely on this, you're probably going to ask me a question: How often do you get delayed? Sorry. How much it costs? Okay, let's keep the cost, let's say the same. Okay, there's a promotion going on, it's all the same. So you will think about the delay next, right? So you'll say, how often does the plane get canceled? Because planes get canceled more than trains. Yes? Yes or no? Wake up. I can't believe you're still closing your eyes. Wake up, wake up, wake up. All right, now, now then the simple question. In the last, uh, last uh, 10 days, I have seen the plane delay by at least 20 minutes, three times. The last 10 days, 
I have observed that the plane delayed by 20 minutes three times. So what is the probability of the plane being delayed? Sorry? But it's same 20, if, it's, if I add 20 minutes to my 40 minutes, it becomes the same as a train. Okay? You have to go to the airport, right? In US, if you go to the airport, they're going to do all kinds of tests on you. And, and if you're a brown guy with black hair, they'll pull you aside randomly every time. Nobody does it in my trains. Okay, so there's a lot of things that happen um, in US and um, I'm, I'm proudly American, but uh, this happens. So putting all this, my, now I'm coming it even at a lower level. 10 days, three times I have observed 20 minutes delay. My simple question is, what is the probability of a flight delay? What is the probability of a delay? Three times in 10 days. <laughs> Let's do this slowly. Three times, out of 10 days, out of 10 flights, three flights have been delayed by 20 minutes. What is the probability of a flight delay? Sorry? No. Let me be even more precise. Three times in 10 days, this flight to Venice has been delayed. Okay? What is the probability of a Venice flight being delayed? 0.5. Any other numbers? There are 10 flights that should have flown, okay? I have observed three times that the flight has been delayed. What is the probability of the flight delay? Okay, forget flights. <laughs> Turns out that people bring in all kinds of cognitive things in flights. Let's come up with a very, 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 very simple example, okay? The last 10 days, my phone shuts itself down automatically three times. Out of 10 days, three days, it has automatically shut down. What is the probability that it will shut down today? I'm giving examples, real examples from my life. I don't think that resonates with you. All right, let's go for something even simpler so that we can see. I see 10 of you, three of you are wearing a red shirt. What is the probability of me seeing a red shirt? I'm keeping the numbers the same and asking the same question in different directions. So give me an answer <laughs> so that we can move on. 0 0.5, 3, 0.3, why is that? 3 by 10. So you have three observations of red divided by 10 of other including red. Is that right? That is what we call as maximum likelihood estimation. A simple concept is what we call as MLE, maximum likelihood estimation. Where th this is how you estimate in any Bayesian networks. You are estimating this by the fraction of counts that particular random variable takes a particular value given that the parents takes a specific value divided by the total number of times the parent takes that value. Does it make sense? It is basically just fractional counts. Turns out that this doesn't quite work all the time because I could say something like in my training data, I have no blue shirts. Okay, there are zero blue shirts out of 10. And then you ask this question, what is the probability of a blue shirt? According to my trained model, I'm gonna say zero. But that means that if in a test example, if I see a blue shirt, this model will fail spectacularly. So you do what is called as a Laplacian correction most of the times. You will add one to the numerator and the number of possible observations to your denominator. It's called a Laplace correction. Kind of acts like a regularization to avoid overfitting, okay? So, but what I want uh, you to get is this notion of maximum likelihood estimation, where you are simply counting the fraction, really computing the fraction of time, the number of observations, divided by the total number of possible observations. 
okay um, this is what we call as maximum likelihood observation this is works very well if your data is fully uh, observed if the data is partially observed that is if the data is incomplete then um, uh, how, how do we do this let's say that i see 10 shirts but i can observe nine shirts correctly the 10th shirt i don't observe before i open my eyes that person leaves how do i handle it any intuitions does it make sense let's say there are two types of shirts red and blue there are only two colors one red shirt and blue shirt for nine observations i've got it right i've got five red shirts four blue shirts the tenth observation i'm not able to see it how will you do it i'm not able to see the tenth uh, person before I see he or she left the room. How will I handle it? Yes. Okay. How do you guess? Guess is correct, but how do you guess? Based on what I've seen so far, right? So I've seen five red shirts and four blue shirts. What do you think is the tenth one? Sorry, blue, why? You have seen, I've seen only four blue and five reds. Why do you pick blue? Okay, so did I say five blue? All right, sorry. So five blue and four red, okay. And now you're saying blue because you're looking at the maths. Okay, that's called an imputation technique. Where I'm basically replacing the unobserved with the maximum value. I could also replace instead of max, I could do average. What? can be bold and replace the min and so on and so forth okay in em kind of like that little bit uh, uh, here where what i'm going to do is i'm going to use one of the techniques and uh, what I, I can do is i can do the sound based on that so i'm re so i said five blue four red i'm going to assume that this is going to be a blue uh, as well so six blue and four red i get 0 0.6 and 0 0.4 that gives my distribution i'll go back and i will uh, iterate okay so the idea is kind of like that here so let's say there are two variables a and b um, this is again I think due to Christian uh, a really nice example um, let's say the probability of a being true is half the probability of b being true given a is true is half probability of b given true is half so this is what I'm going to start with I'm assuming a uniform distribution I'm not making any assumptions on the data I'm just making everything uniform and let's say that they only take two values true and false this is my observation. It's incomplete. As you can see, I've seen a true, 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 but I didn't observe B. False, true, true, false, false. I have not observed B. Okay. Based on this, what I'm going to do is I'm going to only look at the complete data and I'm going to compute the expected counts. So what I have is I have true, 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 false, false, true, and true, true, uh, true, false, false, true, false, false. These are my conditional tables. I'm going to look at my data and I'm going to fill in the counts, okay? So I know that when A is true, B is true is one, that I know is true. But the second time that A is true, I don't really know what B is, B's value is, okay? So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to say, I'm going to look into this distribution and this distribution says that B is true when A is true with a probability of half. So I'm going to say here that it's going to be true with half probability and false with half probability. Based on that, what I'm going to do is true, true is going to get one here and I'm going to add 0.5 here. This is going to be the number of observations, 1.5. Does it make sense? Same thing with true and false. I have one true and one false. So I know that's one. And this distribution is telling me this is another 0.5. So this is another 1.5. Okay. The false case, I know that it's true with point. Uh, I mean, I know that it's true once. And then the next time it's half. So 1.5 here, but I have not seen a false false at all. So that's going to be 0.5 here because this is going to be 0.5 and 0.5 in the beginning. Make sense? If you don't, please put your hand up. Otherwise, this lecture is going to be a torture for the next three hours. So you have to tell me if you don't understand this. So all we're doing is basically computing the expected counts by looking at what is already true and what my current model tells me. So what are you doing? You're taking an incomplete data table and completing it with counts. And now what you do is based on this, you maximize it. Now you're saying, what is the probability of A being true? 
then I'm going to compute the, the terms in which A is true. A is true in this column, I'm sorry, in this row and in this row. So that's 1.5 plus 1.53 divided by everything. So three by five, so that's 0. 0.6. So this is three, 4.5, five, that's 0. 0.6. Three by five is 0. 0.6. Now my B give, equals true given A equals true. Um, again, you can look at this. B is true given A equals true. That's this possibility. So that's 1.5 divided by uh, 1.5 plus 1.5 because that's where A is true. So this is B is true given A is true. Just compute the value where both B and A are true divided by only when A is true, which is 1.5 1, 1 divided by 1.5 plus 0.5. That's 0.5. B is true given A is false. Remember, uh, there is no false false here in this table. So obviously this is going to change because the only observation I have is when for uh, A is false, B is true. Okay, so this has gotten a bit more skewed towards 0.75. But the nice thing is none of them is going to one quickly. So it's, it's very good. So what you do is with this, you go back and you reiterate. Now you do your resampling. Of course, now things change a little bit. Um, you have to compute the counts. They will change also a little bit and, and keep going. Okay, so this is what is called expectation maximization. The idea is you complete the uh, data with your expected counts and iterate until you converge. So uh, this is what you do in, uh, in standard graphical models. For relational probabilistic models, it's the same thing, except you hold one additional constraint where you have to make sure that instances of the same uh, object have share the same parameters. So if I talk about uh, a father's influence on, 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 let's say, the diabetes of um, the children, then any time you look at any father, it has to be the same parameter of that instance. If I have, let's say, parents influence separately and grandparents influence separately, doesn't matter whether it's your mother or father, as long as you talk about a parent, it's the same influence, it has to share the same parameters. It's called parameter tying, and you have to make sure that any instance of that uh, parameter share, uh, of that object has the same parameters. So here, for instance, I have a, a let's say a blue uh, coming to an orange. So every instance of blue coming to an orange should have the same parameter. Okay. And how do you do that? You can do that via what is called aggregation or combining rules. I'll briefly mention them um, if you're interested. And you do the exact same uh, EM again. So uh, you will have the same logic program. In this case, given the current model, you compute the expectations and fill your data based on this. You maximize it and keep going. And filling this in requires probabilistic inference. That's where I think a combination of a nice lifted inference technique with a learning method can make it more powerful. OK, I have two examples that uh, we will concretely ground out to make sure that um, you understand what is going on. So when I was a grad student, this is about 15 years back, we had a problem in Oregon state of West Nile virus. Actually, I just got that alert when I came to Italy about West Nile virus um, here too. So the West Nile virus is, uh, is carried by mosquitoes and uh, they spread very quickly. And uh, the way that the West Nile virus population is estimated is by looking at the number of uh, uh, days since the last rainfall, okay? The last time it rained, um, mosquitoes get accumulated and if the temperature is above freezing, just above freezing, they actually thrive pretty well, okay? So, the, so to do that, um, one thing that people do is that they look at the temperature and rainfall every single day since the last time it froze. So to, since the last freezing and rain, I'm gonna calculate the rainfall every single day since the last time it froze. So what I'll have is a bunch of temperature rain measurements. But here is the problem, in one site, the freeze might have been last week. In another site, the freeze might have been last month. In the third site, the freeze might have been six months back. How do you calculate all the data? A simple way is average, right? You can average the temperature since the last freeze. You can calculate the average rain in the, since the last freeze. And then you can take, um, learn a distribution based on that. Simply do your fractional counts, like how we talked about. With me so far? Yes or no? Yeah. So this is basically what we call as aggregators. They come from the database idea where you're looking at, if I write as an SQL query, you basically say select average of temperature from blah, where this condition is satisfied, okay? So that's the easy way to write this. Um, you can get this information. 
The other way to do this is kind of taking a, what is called as a distributional uh, view. Now you basically think of every day you generate a distribution over the population. So because I get measurements for every day, um, I know the temperature and rain at every day, I can get a distribution over the mosquito population every day. So for that day, what is the population? Independent of everything else. Do this for every single day. And then what you can do is take these, combine all these distributions to give you a final distribution. This combination function can be anything. It can be a weighted mean, mean. There are several things like noisy R and so on and so forth that you can work with. There are more complex combination functions. The key thing is that all these three are the same conditional distributions. So you can actually reuse the data to estimate these three. And these three distributions are obtained to uh, get the final distribution. Again, you can do expectation maximization. Um, we have a paper on, on doing expectation maximization. Daphne Kohler had a paper earlier about a similar topic. Any questions? Um, and of course, uh, uh, you can do the same thing for Markov logic networks. Um, people have covered MLNs, and I'm going to talk about MLNs uh, uh, a little bit later. Um, in MLNs, it's, remember, it is their weighted logic classes. So you have weights and you have the classes. To compute the distribution, you calculate the number of times a particular class is solved and take the, the product of the weight. So when I'm learning the weight, in the parameter learning setting, the classes are given, the weights are not. So you're going to learn the weights. So how do you do that? You do that based on a simple expression, which basically says, um, compute the number of times a particular class is true in the data. So look at the data, just calculate the number of times it's true in the data, minus the expected number of times according to the model. Okay. So if you go back here, um, uh, this is what we call as the expected counts, right? So you compute the expected counts by applying the current probabilities. You can do the same thing for MLNs. Um, uh, you compute the expected uh, uh, number of times it's true according to the current model. So you set a particular weight and compute uh, the expected number of counts with respect to that weight, and the difference becomes your gradient, and you keep uh, go in the direction of gradient, update your weights, and uh, so on. Except if it was this easy, life is very good. Uh, it's not because it's hash free complete to num uh, calculate the number of true groundings and the expectation. So the question is, how do you do that? You can do this in several different ways. And uh, let's skip the math. You are already very, very, very bored. So let's go on and talk about this. The key difference is computing this expectation um, will require summing over all possible worlds. So I have to look at every instance of every predicate and look at all of them to compute this expectation. Again, hash be complete. So what do you do? Um, you replace it to saying that I'm not going to look at all classes when I'm computing the likelihood. I'm only looking at things that are in the Markov blanket that are directly attached to the predicate that I'm learning. So this is called, in some sense, um, discriminative learning. And if, once you make that assumption, it's called pseudo likelihood assumption. It boils down to just looking at your neighborhoods instead of the whole thing. Turns out that even this is very, very hard. So what uh, many people, including our group, have done is look at other methods for learning these. A classic way of doing this is converting this to a graph and op operating some graph theoretic measures on this. Okay, so what I'm going to do is really give you that three minute break. You look extremely bored, so we'll come back in three minutes. Don't go anywhere, stay here. Um, check your emails, whatever, we'll, we'll talk in three minutes. <laughs> so, um, we talked about parameter learning. Now, I'm going to talk uh, briefly about structure learning. And in structure learning, um, first we will start again talk a little bit about graphical models, a little bit about logical models um, before going uh, on about star AI models or um, uh, uh, probabilistic logic models, okay? So let's talk about gra probabilistic uh, graphical models. If you have complete data, that is if your data is fully observed, like in our previous case, you start learning a model, okay? So you say that S and C influence C influence D. Maybe that's what you start with. And then you can do several of other op operations and three specific operations. You can choose an edge and delete it. You can add a new edge or you can choose an edge and reverse it. So those are three operations that is uh, typically done. It's basically what you call a search, uh, search and score. So you search over the space of operators and you score the model and you figure out if it's better. Okay. 
So for instance, here I'm going to delete the edge between C and E and I get this model where C is kind of like an island. Where it's not connected to anything, but S is the parent of E, E is the parent of D. In the other case, what I'm going to do is I'm going to choose the C, E, H and uh, reverse it. So now becomes E becomes the parent of C. So S is the parent of E and E is the parent of C and D in the current model. And then or what you could do is you could add C to D. Okay. And there is a new H coming here. So what you do is basically um, once you uh, start with this model, you could go into any of these three places. Um, you choose an operation, you perform it, you find a score. Okay, the score, typically most of the structure learning algorithms have two components, which is the log likelihood, which is how does your data, um, um, I mean, how does your model uh, satisfy the data? So you look at the data and you ask, how good does this model represent the data? Uh, intuitively, if you think about it, a complete graph, a complete graph subjected to the DAG will be the best result because it'll have the maximum likelihood. Okay, but um, because it's complete, it will easily overfit, which means if I give a new data point, it will break. So what you do is you add a penalty term for model complexity. So you will have your log likelihood, which is the score, minus a penalty, which kind of uh, penalizes uh, larger models. And based on what your penalty is, these the scoring matrix vary. You have BIC, AIC, and so on. I see a question. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. So EM is a local search. So uh, yeah, yeah. You'll try to get there locally. Same thing happens here. So, uh, but you'll also have a penalty, right? The the one the structure that maximizes uh, the MLE is your complete model. Right, you're complete. Yeah, throw in as many arcs as possible. You'll get a very good MLE, but that cannot generalize because you're you're creating a, such a complex model that fits your data very well. That if I change the data a little bit, um, uh, the model fails spectacularly. So to get that to work, what you do is you add a model penalty, aka classic machine learning calls it regularization. Here they call model uh, penalty. So you come the, the larger your model is, the higher your penalty. Okay. And and, um, and and that's typically a scoring function. So you do your uh, score uh, search, score and search uh, method like this. Again, most of these are locally optimal if you have hidden data. Okay, uh, that's something that is accepted. And of course, you can also have a structural EM, which is basically um, if I'm doing structure learning with incomplete data, you start with an initial structure. You have your training data in the M, in the parameter learning case. You filled in the conditional probability tables based on the MLE parameters, based on your current assumptions, you do that based on the current structure. Based on the current structure, you compute expected counts. Now you can do the same thing. You can do your scoring and parameterization based on that. Um, uh, come back with a new model. Maybe you have, based on different, uh, you could get different sets of counts and uh, you could get different operations and different parameters um, and, and you keep going until convergence. Okay, so you will reiterate, keep going this under con convergence. This is how you learn standard probabilistic graphical models. And the reason why this is important is basically all of these are lifted for the relational uh, case. Okay, so if you figure out how to do the probabilistic graphical models, right, and you understand how these logical systems work, you can put them together and you kind of lift these learning methods. So the underlying principles are basically the same. You do the MLE, you do the expectation maximization, or you do a score and search, uh, or a structural EM in, in the case of uh, uh, hidden data. So, um, of course, um, I'm pretty sure somebody should have covered this on um, inductive logic programming. Um, inductive logic programming was uh, beautifully defined in 96 as essentially doing machine learning on, on, on uh, in some sense, uh, logic, uh, logical data and kind of getting a logic program out. So, given examples of first order atomic formulas, essentially, I'm giving you the atom ground instances, each nipple to positive or negative. I have some background knowledge. Um, these could be some else uh, type of rules, and I have some constraints um, on how to add rules. Typically, most of these language bias are in the form of what we call as modes. You specify how to control the search of your uh, learner, okay? Because a pure inductive learner is complete, is in some sense infinite. I could call recursion 100 times. I could do any kinds of crazy things. Again, I can learn an overly complex model. The language bias, 
controls this search space, make sure that you can generalize better. Okay, so that's the way that ILP systems uh, make sure that you learn something that's robust. So wh what you're uh, trying to do is uh, you will find a hypothesis H that meets the language constraints, and when conjoined with the background knowledge, um, you 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 cover all positive examples, but none of the negative examples. Which means if I learn a concept, it'll cover all positive examples, but none of the negative examples. Again, this could easily overfit. So what we have done is uh, to handle real-world issues such as noise. Uh, we basically say cover the maximum possible uh, uh, positive examples uh, and minimize the number of examples, negative examples. So you maximize the number of positive examples that your theory explains. Maybe one or two negative examples will also be explained, but that's okay. You are able to you are okay with tolerating that um, errors uh, for for generalization to new problems. And again, this is a, a greedy algorithm where um, the, at the highest level, the way <coughs> you do this, you repeat while some positive examples remain uncovered. Find a good class that covers as many positive examples as possible, but maybe few negatives. You add the class to the theory and remove and keep going. Okay. So um, at least in most of the initial uh, ILP uh, 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 research, this is typically the approach. Um, and the question is this, this function of finding a good class. That can change. And that was where most of the research was. And, and I think it's matured a lot as a field. So now let's put this kind of a classal search uh, with uh, the, uh, the probabilistic search. You can get a star AI model. So for instance, there's been a lot of work. I'm uh, actually casting and look, they did a previous work on this uh, as early as 2004, where what they did was they, given the data, first they learned the rules and then learn the probabilities. So it is a two step process. Um, first is I'm going to traverse the space of possible hypothesis and then uh, I'm going to get a bunch of rules and for each rule you can learn a weight, you can learn a probability and so on. So that's typically uh, the way uh, uh, it was done in the beginning. And uh, for Markov logic networks, which to me uh, frankly is one of the more matured uh, search uh, for uh, structure learning. Um, in terms of structure learning work, there's been a lot of work on Markov logic networks primarily because they've been going on for 13 years. Um, and I'm sure uh, uh, Luke covered the prob log uh, structure learning approach, which has also uh, been uh, quite uh, successful recently. So for MLNs, uh, there have been several approaches. And let's uh, look at a few of them. One is called the top-down approach, where I'm going to start with unique classes, and then I'm going to add new classes. So I'm going to st start with the unique classes, which is basically just a class of length one, and I add new classes. So you keep adding more and more until uh, you hit some scoring function. Bottom up is the exact opposite. I'm going to use data to generate uh, candidate classes. Um, some machine learning methods such as max margin. By the way, if you are in the field long enough, this uh, is uh, very well known. Machine learning goes in cycles, right? So in 90s, uh, early 90s, neural networks were very popular, and then they kind of lost uh, popularity. So Bayesian networks became pretty popular towards the end of 90s, early 2000s. Reinforcement learning was doing great in mid 2000. And around 2007, uh, when the ICML was held in Corvallis, Oregon, I was uh, uh, heavily involved in local organization at that point, helping people. One thing that we realized is if your paper had the word margin in it, the chances of getting in was pretty high because support vector machines were peak at that point. This is late 2007, 2008, 2009. And it was not a, a coincidence that that's when the max margin approaches for MLNs also came through. People started using max margin approaches which uh, essentially does a discriminative learner that maximizes the margin that works great. What I've done so far is really taught at a pretty abstract level. So I'm going to give you one example. Again, slides uh, due to Pedro Domingo's on these. Um, is hypergraph lifting. So you're, let's say you're interested in learning with hypergraph lifting. So in some sense, I'm kind of talking finally concrete. Let's say that I have three predicates, advisors, teachers, and TAs. So this is where uh, a student, say, uh, Sam, um, is advised by Pete or Saul is advised by Pete or Sarah is advised by Paul. Okay, so you have these data talking about who advises whom and then who teaches what course. So Pete teaches CS1 and 2, Paul teaches uh, CS2 and so on, and who has been a teaching assistant, TA for a particular course. Sam is a TA for this and so on. So that's my ground data. Okay, from this, what I'm going to do is basically uh, construct a hypergraph. Okay, in this data, I'm pulling out all the entities. So for instance, I know that Pete, Paul, Pat, so these are all 
um, the professors. And this is a nice example because professors start with P. Uh, they somehow figured out at least four names that start with P. Students start with S. So these are all the students. Um, okay, and these are all the courses. And the, in some sense, you construct a hypergraph. You, you basically say, if, if there is a, a, a student who is advised by a professor, draw an edge there. Okay, so Pete advises Sam and Saul. So there's an edge between uh, Pete and Sam and Pete and Saul. Okay, and there's an edge between Paul and Sarah and so on. Similarly, you can do the same thing. Uh, connect every course that Pete teaches with Pete, Paul teaches with Paul, blah, 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 blah. Do the same thing. Do the same thing for uh, the TAs as well. Sam, Sarah, and you use different colors only for just visual representation, but they are really the same colors. Okay, so now what I can do is I can start constructing, in some sense, a higher order uh, graph. So, but remember, in this particular graph, the nodes are the constants. The hyper edges tell you whether this atom is true in the world. So, if an advice relation is true, then there is an edge uh, capturing that relation. Okay. Now you can start doing clustering. So this is basically what we call as lifting in some sense. Um, you can lift this to a higher order graph, a second order uh, in some sense. So what do you do? You group all the professors together and then start drawing an edge, um, student, TA. So you get this um, giant graph. So in, in some sense, uh, the uh, lift, lifted hypergraph lifting or LHL uh, lifts the uh, graph into a more compact representation by jointly clustering the nodes into higher level concepts. Okay, as a consequence of clustering the nodes, so you're clustering the nodes, as a consequence of clustering the nodes, you're in some sense clustering the edges as well. Okay, um, but of course, if you look, look at this lifted graph, you have fewer nodes, fewer edges, and therefore fewer paths. Okay, so this is much easier to work with. So what do you do uh, here is uh, using this, uh, you now start uh, traversing the path. So I will maybe start with a student and I will traverse. So I will start with a student. I can go to professor. I can go to teachers. I can go to TA. And then what I can do is I can start constructing classes. So start finding paths. So in some sense, what you're doing is uh, you're doing a path finding which traces the paths in the lifted uh, hypergraph. So it's kind of like a depth first search. So it has the flavor of a depth first search where you start uh, from each hyper edge in this lifted hypergraph recursively add hyper edges that are linked and uh, you can have any kind of termination condition you can have a max length you can say when i don't have a new hyper edge i will stop and so on so maybe i keep my max length as three then i get this so i could start from advices and then i could go to teachers that becomes one thing but here remember i, I maybe i start with sam i go to uh, uh, sorry i start with students i go to professors from there i go to ta then these two are held to be the same and uh, these two are obviously different and same thing i could go from advices to teachers and from teachers to tas so they these two share the professor these two share the ta so basically what you're doing is you're walking on this hypergraph in a depth first search uh, fashion okay and then what you can what you can do is you can start creating classes um uh, this, this works Okay, so now you can start creating classes. You start looking at this and say advices, a professor, set of professors, students, teachers, uh, professor teaches courses, and student TA courses. And so uh, what happens is you basically uh, place each cluster in a path with a variable. And now you can create a variableization for the atom. So what you do is you start creating a variableization uh, by adding uh, variables. So you get advices, PS. And now you place the same variable P. You have to make sure that these two are the same variable. That's when you can walk the random walk. So from here, you go here, and then you add this uh, new class. From here, you go here, uh, uh, sorry, add this new predicate. From here, you can come here, add this predicate. So um, you, you replace each cluster with a variable. You have conjunction of positive literals. Um, you convert this into a class, and then of course you can learn Wait. So with this, though, uh, I can create multiple types of classes. Uh, one class that says advises PS and teaches PC and uh, TSSC. The other one that I could do is basically I can start adding negations and so on. I can have not teachers, not TAs, teachers and not TAs, not teachers, not uh, sorry, uh, not teachers and TA or TAs and so on. I could keep going. Yeah. 
Okay. Okay. Uh, you have four pe four teachers. Okay. That's okay. That doesn't matter. Even if I have, let's say, three professors who don't teach a course and only one professor that teaches a course. That is okay. When you create this thing, you're gonna, that will be captured here. That's, that's actually a good point, right? So you might have that, um, not all the courses, uh, not all the professors teaches, but you can create a predicate like this, that says uh, not teachers, and that gives you that, or teachers. And based on how your Han class works, it can change one way or the other. This is a Han class, for instance. Okay, that's, that's a good question, it doesn't matter. You can create all these combinations. Actually, uh, there recently there's a lot of work on random words, um, primarily by uh, William Cohen, I guess, who's an invited speaker at ILP next week. Um, and William Cohen has done a lot of random works based on this. What we have shown is, and I'm not talking about this today, but we have a recent paper, uh, even last year, and actually a paper under review, where you can learn yeah, hundreds of random works. We actually learn more than 500, 600 random works and then you can train them, put them as inputs to a neural network. And that's okay too, like you could do the same thing here. Instead of putting it to a neural network, I could put it to a logistic regression function and it still works. Okay, so um, you have a good question, but I think it can be done. Okay, which brings me um, to uh, something that we have been doing a lot um, on uh, what we call as boosting of statistical relational learning. So um, if you think about whatever I have seen, um, the way we have been dealing with was let's find models with a finite set of parameters. So in Markov logic network, I learn a bunch of rules and I will uh, learn the parameters for each rule, the weights for each rule. Okay. The thing is, this is fixed. Yeah, I mean, I may learn 100 rules, I may learn 1000 rules, but I'm still fixing the number of rules in advance and the number of weights in advance. So the number of parameters are fixed. But the point is, um, most of these, I, the power of ILP is the fact that we can extend it to, in some sense, infinite domains. The power of logic is that we can extend to infinite domains. So what we want to do is kind of drop the idea of finite models. Maybe we can learn infinite models if we want to. So uh, what, this is what is called in classic machine learning as non-parametric learning. So we want to do this. Non-parametric doesn't mean no parameter, actually. It means the opposite. It means infinite parameters. So we can learn with a lot of parameters um, that we want to do. So um, again, to motivate this idea better, uh, Let's say that on one side I have the experts time, I have the learning time, okay? In the cases where I'm purely doing only reasoning, the qualitative structure, which is the structure of this more, the, the probabilistic graphical model, and the parameters, which is basically the, the weights, the conditional distributions are given together, okay? In that case, there's really no learning. Everything is done uh, by the expert. You only do probabilistic reasoning. Somewhere in the middle is uh, the parameter learning where um, the goal is, Okay, I have a bunch of uh, graphical uh, structures that was given to me and, uh, and, uh, and the database. And then using this data, I can do maximum likelihood estimation, expectation maximization, whatever I want to do, I can learn the parameters, okay? Of course, here, there's a, a, a significant effort in terms of uh, the expert's time, but uh, the learning time is still on the lower side. On the other uh, extreme is where I'm learning the full model structure um, where the expert really defines only the background knowledge, in some sense like ILP, the language bias, and then the, the learning algorithm takes care of the rest. So the question we are asking is, somehow can we push the learning time of structure learning closer to parameter learning? And doing, um, we have been trying to do that with this notion of uh, functional gradient boosting, okay? So how many of you know what XG boost is? Put your hands up. Okay, one of you. Um, so what I'm gonna try and do is kind of explain this. So if you know this already, uh, 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 sorry about that, but uh, let's say uh, I wanna explain this uh, slowly so you get what I'm talking about. The key uh, insight is instead of learning a single monolithic model, instead of learning a one set of classes with the weights, we wanna learn multiple weak models. Maybe the classes themselves are not perfect, but together, putting together, you get uh, a lot of it's like the wisdom of the crowd. Not one is perfect, but putting them together, you get the bang for the buck. 
Okay, so we want to do this. And this was first explored, at least in my uh, uh, limited understanding, in the context of uh, Star AI by Kirsten and uh, in, in, uh, about 10 years back. And we have extended it uh, to uh, different uh, um, algorithms. And we actually even wrote a brief, uh, recently, a book on this topic. Uh, a brief book on this topic. The idea is very simple. You start with an initial model. You look at the data. You make predictions on this model. The difference between the data and predictions become what are called gradients, or the weights for the examples. Um, now you learn another small model, um, which uh, aims to model this gradient. Okay? This model will aim to capture these gradients as closely as possible, add them to the uh, model, um, and keep going until convergence. Um, uh, and, and your final result is simply a set, uh, some of these models. Okay. Now this is pretty abstract. Let me uh, uh, let me ground it out to make this very clear. Okay. So let's say we are interested in, in predicting heart attacks. Okay. According to the data, I don't. Uh, Sriram has a heart attack. Okay. According to the data, um, your name? Yeah. Sorry. Giuseppe. Is that right? Okay. So he does not have a heart attack. Okay, now uh, you look fit. You look pretty fit. So he doesn't have a heart attack in the data. Sriram has a heart attack. So what happens? Initially, I'm starting with 0 0.5, 0 0.5. I learn a small tree which maybe looks at the weight and basically says if your weight BMI is greater than something, you have a heart attack. So in my initial model, um, my model predicts that Sriram has a heart attack with 0.73 probability. Okay, the model predicts that Giuseppe right has a heart attack with 0.17 probability. Okay. But in the data, I don't have, I have a heart attack. He doesn't have a heart attack. So my prediction should have been one because that's the probability of me having a heart attack because that's what my data says. So my model says I have a heart attack. I don't know, I said 0.73, I guess. So my gradient is one minus 0 0.73. 0 0.73 is what the model predicted. One, it should be what the model should have predicted. So the difference between what is true minus the probability of being true according to the model. Okay, so my weight is 1 minus 0 0.73, that is 0.27. He, on the other hand, has no heart attack, which means the model should have predicted with probability of 0, but the model predicted with 0.17. So his weight, 0 minus 0.17, negative 0.17. The quick thing that you should get here is if you are a positive example, the max you can reach is 0, sorry, 1. And so uh, the gradient is always positive, greater than or equal to 0. If it's a negative example, the, mag the value should be zero all the time. So the gradient is always negative, less than or equal to zero. So what is the model trying to do? In the next iteration, I'm going to learn a small model, which doesn't get me for one, but it gets the 0.27. It wants to cover the 0.27 mistake. For him, it wants to cover the negative 0.17 mistake. So what happens is all the positive examples are pushed towards one as closely as possible. All the negative examples are pushed close to zero as closely as possible. Does it make sense? Yes or no? Okay, this is what we call as gradient boosting. The key thing is the trees that we learn. If you go back a few slides and remember that heart attack tree, we learn simple trees like that. Very small trees, just two levels of logical predicates. So it's just a simple conjunction. And at the leaves, we don't learn probabilities, we learn regressions. So they can be regression function. So the original theory by Friedman showed that these can be any regression functions. So they can be trees, they can be weighted classes, they can be any regression functions, and they work well. OK, with me so far? Yes? OK, so uh, what do we do with this? We can, turns out we can learn multiple types of models. I'll show a few of them before we go for the coffee break. The first one is what is called as uh, relational dependency networks. And these are good examples um, to kind of illustrate our idea. OK, they are cyclic graphical models. Let's say we are predicted predicting the satisfaction of a student. It depends on the course that the student is taking, the grade the student gets, and maybe who advises that student, and whether they are writing any papers, and maybe the satisfaction of the student is uh, affecting who is advising the student, because um, it could be that, um, it could be that if the student is not satisfied, the student is not gonna work with me, right? So, uh, but the thing is, as you can see, it's like cyclic, so there are cycles, which means in a Bayesian network, you can get a joint distribution. So you get an approximate joint distribution. Turns out that you can do deep sampling to learn this approximate uh, joint distribution. The cool thing about this uh, method is that if I keep satisfaction as my target, I can run my gradient boosting separately. 
if i keep advices as my target i can run them separately and and grade as my target i can run them separately the cool thing is that they can be run in parallel and so it's actually a pretty fast scalable thing and works very well on large amounts of data so let me do this with a, a simple example so what i'm going to do is i'm going to uh, take a, a, a simple log uh, in some sense a sigmoid function but i'm going to say the probability of an example being true is going to be this functional representation is e power some function psi divided by 1 plus e power that psi okay now with this basically e power 0 right this one so you get this and you can um, work off of this and now i can take a gradient with with respect to the psi and not with respect to the p so what you do is in typically you take the log likelihood which is sum over the log of the probabilities you get that and here in the standard probabilistic models and probabilistic graphical uh, models uh, probabilistic relational models you will take this and you will differentiate with respect to p okay you will take this log likelihood and you will uh, differentiate with respect to p um, the theta space the, the if you look um, denote this as theta you will take the uh, differentiation with respect to theta that becomes your log and you work with it the only change that we are going to make here is don't differentiate this uh, function with respect to theta differentiate with respect to psi okay what friedman showed was if i want to represent uh, differentiate this with respect to psi then i don't need to i can drop the summation i can differentiate separately for each example i can differentiate separately for each example and then that becomes nicely this i minus p i saying is this example true in the data minus the probability of being true the model okay in this case did he have a heart attack no minus the probability of the heart attack according to the model so zero minus this for me it is one minus this the cool thing is you can compute these gradients individually instead of jointly over all the examples again this can be parallelized too right so you can do this there's so much efficiency that you can do and now what i can do is once i compute these gradients i can learn a small regression function that only captures these gradients so the way it works is um, let's say that this is my initial I mean, after one iteration, I have these as my weights. You can quickly see that 0.7, x1 is a positive example, x2, x3 are negative examples, and I can keep going. So the first one, I'm learning a predicate p of x. Then I'm basically asking this question, if for, is there some x for which this is true? And yeah, this is the case where it's false. I learn a small weight. If it's true, I come down. Maybe I add a new one, which basically introduces q of x to y. And then I'm seeing does there exist a y for which q of x y is true then i can learn this w1 w2 okay so this is the case when there is at least one y exists here is the case when no y exists yes with me so it's very simple to learn these are fast and efficient and it's uh, stage wise so it works pretty well you can do the same thing for markov logic networks again a popular srl model you know that they have classes and weights and i'm going to skip this because people have talked about this um, and I explained the learning of MLNs. We'll take the same uh, uh, idea, but we'll throw the Z out um, and we will replace. Um, remember, the, when I was talking about the, the pseudo likelihood, you will replace this Z by the local Markov blanket, where you're only looking at the Markov blanket. For MLN, a Markov blanket is simply the set of predicates that are appearing in the classes. Okay? So um, the idea for us is. I can view Markov logic network as a set of relational dependency network. It's very simple. Um, so this is what I have uh, for RDNs. If you remember the log likelihood, it's sum over uh, all the examples, log of P of XI given the parent of XI. Then I take the probability. I compute uh, the, the function like this, W times this. And this is nothing but if this is true and these Ws come from the trees. I'm doing the same thing here. Um, here I have XI given Markov blanket of XI. I have the probabilities. Now, here I have slightly different things where I'm going to look at uh, the psi as the, the weight of the class times the number of times that class is true. Here it is whether the class is true. Here it's the number of times the class is true. Okay, so I'm going to go back quickly here just to make the difference clear. So when I'm doing it here, I come down, I take W1, and that's it. Because if, if this class is true, I'm going to take W1. If this class, this, this predicate itself is false, I'm going to take W3. If this is true, but this is false, I'm going to take W2. In MLNs, I'm going to make a small change. I have to count the number of times this is true. I have to count the number of times this is false. And I have to count the number of times this is false. Okay, that's the NT. So that's the only difference between 
um, uh, relational dependency networks and uh, uh, this thing so where your mod in relational dependency networks uh, corresponding to these three steps the first step remember is the model the model is a product of conditional distributions here is the, again a product of conditional distributions but because i'm assuming pseudo -level. each conditional distribution can be learned independently here you cannot learn them independently because i need the uh, tying between the parameters because you can use exist as your aggregator here you have to compute the number of times it's true we have done some work on optimizing this as well okay so the thing is that uh, you can actually very easily uh, take a particular uh, idea here and you can look at this and you can say if i'm learning a, a markov logic network for this thing and, and this is a tree that i'm learning for an mln you're basically saying this is the number of times uh, you're making sure that p of x is greater than zero similarly the number of times q of xy is greater than zero and i have to keep that count but this is the number of times q of xy is false right so q of xy is never satisfied here and p of x is never satisfied here so one thing you can do um, is you can start constructing these classes which says p of xy and q sorry p of x and q of xy implies whatever i'm learning with a weight w1 p of x and there exists no y such that q of xy is true implies target x and there exists no x uh, so it's a p of x is true implies target x so these are w3 w2 and w1 <clears throat> now if i star this long enough what i can do is i can actually drop these two paths i can drop this path and drop this path because this is just giving me the number of instances to be zero um, and what i have is only the left path um, so you might ask me a simple question if i'm going to drop these two paths why are you even learning them because turning turns out that learning trees is easier than learning classes so i can actually learn these trees much faster than i learn classes that this implementation is pretty cool so what we do is in some sense we are forcing w2 and w3 to be zero and drop these completely yes with me so far so we have a similar algorithm for relational logistic regression um i think i have three minutes right um so uh, what I'm going to do is kind of stop the uh, uh, go to the break with some elementary models that we can think about Okay, so the first elementary model is what is called in classic uh, uh, Machine learning as naive Bayes model where you have the target Q which is influencing a bunch of features Okay, so you have Q is a parent of R of X and X can take multiple values Remember Q doesn't have any X. So if I X can take multiple values, I can have multiple instances here I can have the opposite where r of x is a parent of q this is basically what we call as relational logistic regression okay multiple parents can influence this this could be the number of papers let's say r is the paper and q is u okay so every student writing a bunch of papers so x is the paper index you can have different papers that maybe q is your satisfaction how satisfied you are okay if you're satisfied you write a lot of papers that is naive base if you write a lot of papers you are satisfied logistic regression and MLN typically says how satisfied you are and how uh, how many papers you write they are kind of correlated there's no causal structure this simple correlation right so those are the three networks so here you get Q to be the parent of multiple R's multiple R's to be the parent of Q and Q connected to multiple R's okay the thing about these three is that they make multiple assumptions okay uh, in some sense naive base and Markov network um, basically make the same assumption that if I observe uh, Q, if I observe Q, then the R's are independent of each other. Because in the Markov logic network case, they are the Markov blanket. So which means if I observe Q, these two are independent because my neighbor is fully observed. For every R, Q is the only neighbor. And if I observe Q, your satisfaction, then the, the, the papers are not dependent on each other, They're completely independent. In a directed model like uh, with aggregation, it's exactly the opposite. They are dependent if I know Q, they are independent if I don't know Q. And if you are wondering about it in the break, go back to the D separation rules of Bayesian networks. You'll understand this very easily. Okay, they are the classic uh, D separation rules. Um, the point we want to show is that uh, with naive base and MLNs, they make sim similar assumptions. Though they are similar looking structures, the assumptions are completely different. Why is this important? Because um, uh, what uh, we have shown is that uh, 
with when you change the number of hours the output probability changes drastically with mlns they kind of go down as they are in decreases and then go up and then come back down again but what you really want are models that are invariant of population sizes what works for 50 people should work for 500 people should work for 5 million people and so on and so forth but clearly there is a lot of difference okay and this is a behavior because of the independence assumptions that they make with this i'll stop here we'll come back to this and show uh, uh, the other approaches okay thanks